going to share all of my screen. Nice. Uh, for those of you who are who don't know um, Klaus, uh, we, in, in the Rust Lint swap, uh, Rust Lint's meetup, we always try to combine some uh, international speakers and some locals. And today, Klaus is both. So we have found the holy grail. He is kind of local and kind of international speaker. Because Klaus, if I remember correctly, you are from Austria, even from Upper Austria. Is that correct? Yeah, I grew up some uh, some 20 kilometers from Linz, uh, close to Hagenberg. So. Ah, very nice. So you see, we founded a Rust meetup to, to give you something back, and maybe in the future we'll come back, and you can come back in, come back home physically to the Rust meetup. Yeah. Charles, we very much enjoy having you here, and with that, the stage is yours. We are looking forward to your talk. All right. So, um, yeah, welcome to from uh, WebAssembly to another topic that is uh, a little bit more uh, down to the metal. In this case, it's uh, trusted computing with Rust on uh, Intel SGX. And yeah, this is also similar to WebAssembly. It's no STD, but WebAssembly has already, the, the, uh, the working group has already done a good job on uh, translating most of the things in there uh, that come with the standard library. So uh, yeah, as uh, you took, <laughs> you, you um, already took that sort of forward. Uh, I grew up in the, uh, close to Linz. I live now in Amsterdam. Uh, and I've, yeah, I've not lived in Austria for like seven or eight years. So, but in the meantime, I've written two uh, Rust books. You can find the, the links to that on my blog. It's about uh, algorithms and data structures and the Rust cookbook. Um, yeah, so I do all kinds of <laughs> different areas in, the, in that respect. So, um, yeah, what is uh, trusted computing? Uh, I think everybody kind of knows the tired uh, already um, saying that the cloud is just someone else's computer. But uh, the reality is uh, you cannot really make sure that what you run on someone else's computer is actually what you wanted to run and that nobody is really sort of listening. Well, that sounds uh, a little bit paranoid. It has, uh, there are some valid use cases to having that. So. You, how do you, so really, how do you verify that the code and the data that you're running are really the things that, uh, that you wanted to run? So use cases, what would, uh, what would be, so crypto finance is a fairly recent one, but in general finance, uh, a particular example is uh, something called the town crier architecture, which makes sure that the data you're receiving on a machine and you're basing your financial decisions on, are not being spoofed by an intermediary party, right? So you make sure that the with uh, TLS uh, encryption that the, 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 the origin of your data is really that the, the data that you are like intending to, to get, right? So the other person, the other party is saying uh, is really who they say they are. And the second thing is that the code that is making your financial decisions and potentially, you know, uh, betting your livelihood on something is really the code that you wanted to run and not uh, something that, you know, some root user that you never intended to have uh, kind of uh, is changing or altering this code. One password, on the other hand, does it uh, has a different use case, is uh, using Intel SGX to secure sort of the, the, um, the password storage and retrieval on uh, win on Windows, I think only, and uh, so authentication security. So it doesn't unpack everything into memory because if someone had access to the, to that particular computer or that memory, they would can uh, be able to create a memory dump and therefore have you know unlimited time to uh, crack your passwords or crack the the sort of the encryption that is that is being used maybe, uh, or even if it's unencrypted in memory which it typically is, uh, just read the passwords really. And um, yeah, verifiable integrity is important in a sense where, uh, where we all kind of know that there are zero day exploits and other things that uh, like cyber attacks in a way that um, do remote code injection um, where they, especially, I mean, Rust protects against that by definition as the language where, you know, you cannot change return addresses or something like that easily, but it happens and you still kind of, uh, there's other ways to, to inject code 
uh, while sort of you're not looking, right? And then the cloud, this is happening on a, uh, this is potentially happening on a larger scale. So uh, Intel uh, wanted to come up with a solution to that, and they have uh, they have worked on that since uh, 2015, and the work is ongoing, and it's called uh, uh, Software Guard Extensions, or SGX for short, and it's an encrypted CPU enclave. So what that really is, uh, is a part of the uh, CPU and a, a separate instruction set that is encrypted in uh, at runtime uh, and at rest. So it's encrypted all the time. It runs on its own uh, instruction set. The CPU even blocks a particular part of the memory that you cannot access from uh, from the operating system. So the goal is really uh, to ensure that whatever you're running in there is confidential and uh, with a different set of keys. It also guarantees that this uh, that the integrity is um, is really uh, yeah guaranteed and that even if you don't know who is running the operating system or really who is, uh, yeah, what, you know, who has access to this stuff. So um, a little bit more about Intel SGX. Uh, I have come across uh, that recently in a, in a, yeah, in the consulting work that I do. And uh, it's really interesting to see sort of what that, um, yeah, how to, how that is, has a really particular influence on on the the way you program especially this is all hardware so if you think about it's like your hardware your cpu has extra two extra keys uh, that are that come out of the factory really one is called the root provisioning key rpk and uh, that is sort of intel's master key so by extension you don't you know you don't trust your cloud provider but you have to trust intel on, on that um, and the second one is the uh, the RSK, the root, uh, uh, the the sealed key, um, essentially the root sealed key, and that is uh, specific for your CPU. So, and that is also unknown to Intel, but it's derived from the provisioning key. The the part that in memory that is really um, encrypted is part of the regular RAM, right? Uh, but the encryption key is, uh, is reset every power cycle. So it's uh, impossible to do a replay or a simple replay attack where you just take memory snapshots, for example. And uh, without conventional, uh, like without access, it's basically impossible to do, uh, yeah, to do any sort of attack on that. And conventional means means you know without opening up and using UV lights and uh, observing the sort of the electrical currents inside the CPU. So then you need really that's a really in-depth attack. So um, uh, programming for SGX obviously uh, that's a C and C plus plus territory, and um, since everything is encrypted and everything uh, uses its own. Um, CPU instruction sets and uh, works on a specialized uh, set of memory, it, it has to generate um, proxies, right? So you cannot, you have to dynamically link to a library and that library has proxies generated uh, for each function that is publicly exposed. And this is typically done with an uh, enclave definition language or EDL for short. And you declare those interfaces the build script uh, generates those proxies, and then you can sort of use it as a, no a normal library. And yeah, Intel provides a nice developer manual that's only 400 pages to get into it quickly. Um, yeah. So an application, uh, an SGX-based application has two parts, uh, and trusted part and an untrusted part. So the trusted part is anything that runs inside of the enclave. Un untrusted part is your regular application that calls inside of the enclave. So you typically wouldn't have the entire thing running there, but only the parts you really want to have since it's uh, fairly expensive to kind of call back and forth. And it's also fairly hard uh, to, um, to achieve some things since you're uh, lacking like ellipsy and, and uh, these types of things. 
So uh, how do you communicate between those two parts? Uh, these two parts uh, can be, you know, can call each other, call, and uh, those things are called e-calls, so into the enclave, and uh, o-calls, so out of the enclave. And yeah, the proxy, uh, proxy generation is done by the build script and creates a, uh, yeah, it generates the code that can then ultimately be called. Uh, yeah, as this is no STD, so everything is encrypted by, and this means it needs a specialist memory allocator. And that means also that, yeah, you can maybe translate some things. You can still have like vectors and strings and stuff like that, but uh, they can be limited by this allocator that um, that is being provided there. And yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different, but it's a, it's also quite similar. There's a link at the end for uh, people who want to get really deep into this, how the memory pages look like and what the thread memory allocation pattern uh, looks like. So, you know, to get really, <laughs> to really look at memory layout uh, diagrams and well, yeah, that's definitely uh, a very deeply technical topic. Then Francis, when you run, uh, a, a yeah. question: Is it okay if I relay some questions that come up to you during your talk? Yes, yes. Sorry, for sure. Um, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Rumbo is question is is asking whether the stuff in the enclave is running in parallel to the operating system, like in ARM trust zones. Yes, it's running in parallel. Yeah, we'll see that later in the in the uh, code examples that you start up the enclave whenever, you know, in the beginning of your program and until you sort of shut it down, it's, uh, it exists and you can run threads in it, for example, as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so when you run something in the enclave, uh, you wanna make sure that it actually ran in the enclave and that not someone spoofed your, you know, the, the sort of the call there. So uh, you need something that's called attestation and attestation is nothing nothing really special. It uh, uh, uses encryption or uses um, the cryptography to sign uh, the code or sign the message that comes out of the enclave with the special, uh, the, the RSK, so the, the root sealed key. And um, therefore it can be, since this is a, a derived by from the um, RPK, from the root provisioning key, you can always verify that this signature has been generated by the sealed key uh, of a different CPU. And this is called when, when you do it on a second computer that also has an enclave. Uh, this is called a local attestation. And if you do that with a web service, which Intel provides and uh, also all the cloud providers that, uh, that provide these, um, these yeah, machines, they also provide a remote attestation service, which is a web service where you can just send uh, send the signature and have it um, have it sort of a, a thumbs up, a thumbs down <laughs> that this is running on. Uh, this has been running in a specific enclave. So this is a short of a, a short diagram how this works, right? You see. Um, your application that calls into the enclave, does some stuff, uh, signs it with the, uh, signs this user data with a special key that uh, is from somewhere, um, gives it back to the uh, application, has maybe a different, so this is from a specific application, so this has two enclaves uh, here. And then the challenger is the person or you know someone who wants to know, is this real? And sends this, uh, this user message essentially into uh, the, through the attestation verification and can then say, yeah, I trust this result or I don't trust this result. That could be, for example, very useful in a way when you have a distributed application where everybody sort of uh, in a blockchain manner um, adds data to, you know, to a blockchain and that data you want to know that this has been processed with the same algorithm as everybody else and therefore you wanna have it attested by everyone. And by just providing the key or as part of the message in, in the blockchain, everybody can sort of verify that uh, all of this data has been generated um, as expected. So 
obviously C++ has uh, all uh, as yeah is a little less fun let's say to program than Rust, and this is why uh, they came up uh, Baidu in this case. Uh, so they wanted to keep some stuff confidential apparently. So they came up with a Rust SDK, and Rust in general is a is a good fit in uh, I think given the memory safety for this type of application. And in the meantime, so I think it was Baidu Labs and it was at a Rustfest presentation in Rome, I think, which is uh, two years ago or something. Um, and after that, it got picked up by Apache in the incubator and it's under active development. So it has a new version every couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, you can find it on GitHub and we'll walk through this SDK in a minute, so you'd be proficient in uh, using it and jumping in uh, right away. So the requirements, what do you need to, to run uh, sort of this uh, code? So um, for Mac and Windows, you do need Docker um, and uh, run Docker containers because that's for software emulation of that, um, of the driver. So the, the, Rust, uh, the Rust SDK does not yet work with Windows. There you have to stick to C++ and the Mac doesn't expose the Intel SGX drivers at all. So if you want to get, in, uh, get into compiling your own drivers for the Mac, I'm sure that there's a lot to be learned, but this, the easiest way is to run Baidu Stocker container using, um, yeah, using software emulation of the, uh, of, of the Enclave. You also need a new-ish Intel CPU, so uh, 2015 and later, and um, then you're likely to be able to run uh, a SGX uh, version one um, enclave. So this is the the thing that I'm running here is uh, Lenovo Yoga X1 from 2017, and that supports like uh, almost all of the instructions, but there's there's a uh, second generation SGX um, enclave that is upcoming. And uh, this for this, it lacks one CPU instruction set. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a gamble if you have it, but if you have it and uh, run Linux, you can actually do uh, all of that um, locally. And for that, you also need to, first of all, activate it in, the, in your BIOS or, or AFI, um, and then compile the drivers so you get a, a sort of a generic device, uh, dev SGX device. And yeah, you can also rent uh, a, a cloud, um, sort of, yeah, cloud computing for that, uh, like a cloud VM on Azure, there's a Azure Com a Confidential Compute or I think Alibaba has some uh, as, and as well as Amazon and probably others that I don't know of. Klaus, we have one question which somehow relates to this slide. Um, uh, one person in the audience would like to know whether SGX is really Intel exclusive and whether there is something compatible or similar in, for instance, the, I, I, the AMD Ryzen area or something. Like that. So, um, so Intel, the SGX, the Trusted Compute Platform is, I think, uh, Intel exclusive. Uh, but every, like most websites that I, that I uh, read said that AMD has something, but it's not, not as extensive. So, um, and I didn't find what it was. I think it has some minor parts, but right now I have not seen anything that is sort of, that you could use in both uh, on both like processors, okay, unfortunately, yeah. So um, the Rust SDK itself is is quite extensive already. It has many patched uh, versions of STD um, classes and structs in there. It has a ton of uh, yeah different <laughs> um, different code like code, and it, it, it's quite. Uh, complex in that uh, it provides specialized versions of uh, the threads and also some vectors and uh, or the vector and I think the hash brown uh, hash brown grade create and uh, some of the cryptography uh, stuff in there as well so you can use basic crypto cryptography although uh, for example rust TLS also has a no STD 
version that also works really well in, in, in the enclave. The only downside is that you are relying on a lot of uh, patched stuff. So it's incompatible with the uh, like with all the good stuff that is currently, you know, is a little bit newer, uh, like Tokyo, or if you want to do some other, like not use um, the Rust uh, Rust TLS with no STD, but uh, want to use, for example, connect to a WebSocket or something like that, where you want uh, where you want to have a secure a WebSocket implementation that you don't have to do all of the things yourself. So, yeah, uh, but I think it's getting there since it's active development. And uh, there's also something called Mesa Linux, which is, I think, a, a Linux distribution that is focusing a lot on uh, on SGX and uh, the secure and trusted environment. And from there, they seem to have patched almost, you know, almost any useful crate, uh, starting from CRDA, JSON to, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, other things that usually don't provide a, uh, yeah, a no STD version. Unfortunately, not WebSockets though. So uh, let's look at some of the examples. So uh, the website is everybody knows GitHub and it, it everything is on GitHub. So fairly recently they released version uh, 113 of the SDK. And yeah, the SDK itself, as you can see, there's a ton of stuff that uh, that this sort of trying to emulate um, STD, uh, STD and you know uh, specific types that also kind of, uh, yeah, you need like sealing and unsealing and stuff like that is here for um, for working with the enclave. Um, but let's not work on a web browser, but rather a terminal. I think that's probably more realistic. A little bit larger. So, um, in this case, this is a this is a Azure Confidential uh, Compute VM. So I didn't run this uh, locally because I messed up the drivers, which yeah, <laughs> happens. Um, and it also it runs best on Ubuntu. And this I'm running here at Fedora. So yeah, that's it. It it does work on Fedora, but not in the same. Uh, like it's easier, better compatible with Ubuntu. The sample code uh, that they provide is is much better than whatever I could come up uh, with as a as an example. And in fact, the uh, uh, the company I'm working with is basing a lot of their code also on uh, the sample code because it, it is quite complex to to program anything uh, that works with uh, works with their um, build system specifically. So you can see there's a there's a few um, examples in there, like starting from a regular hello world. That is, this is I think actually C plus plus mostly, but there's a hello Rust that is completely done in Rust. Um, debugging is interesting because uh, in a production enclave, debugging is actually impossible to do. So there's no way to attach you know a, a GDB or something like that to um, to the debug symbols of the running. Um, of the of the yeah of the running code, um, one interesting thing is also TLS that we are going to look like uh, look at. So the TLS is is verifying you know that the remote party is the remote party by um, just making sure that the certificates match. For example, and you do if you do that in the enclave, then you actually have a, have an encrypted data stream that the outside party cannot read. Um, so anyone outside of the enclave cannot read. What you are, you know, what you're exchanging there. Um, there's also some machine learning for those of you who want to do some machine learning inside of the enclave. That um, is is quite interesting to see, but it's uh, fairly, it's more of the easy stuff. So it's not exactly a deep learning uh, experience that you have there, but rather I think a, a k-means, um, so a k-means classification even. So it's not very sophisticated, but it's a translation of, uh, or a patched version of Rusty Machine, I think. Then, um, and, la and last but not least, we are gonna look at uh, the unit tests because, you know, as, a, as good engineers, we wanna test our code. And um, obviously that should also apply to stuff that is running in the enclave, because obviously without the standard library, we don't have a testing framework. 
So there's a way that they came up with that is quite nice to run tests actually. So um, as we go forward a little bit in time, so I did this uh, not too long ago. So you, the preferred way to run and work with SGX is, is in a Docker container. So in this case, I did yeah Docker run, uh, map the current volume uh, into root SGX, map the device uh, as a as an enclave in there, and use the Baidu X la X lab. Um, SGX Rust uh, Ubuntu container with uh, Ubuntu 18.04 with the, uh, the newest Rust SDK also supports 20.04, but I didn't see it yet. So we are working with uh, the old um, sort of, yeah, the old SDK in there. Then uh, there's something that is called the, uh, the AESM service, which uh, manages sort of the enclave access. So it needs to run in the background. And the Docker containers don't have that running by default for some reason, uh, probably because you can also map in a socket and use your outside, right? In this case, I could use the outside thing as well because it's it's installed on uh, the Azure Con Confidential Compute VM as well. So um, if we go into the into or CD into this uh, SGX sample code um, thing, and we do uh, we want to execute the, the hello rust or look in the hello rust thing. We have to run a make file and we'll look at that in a second. And then, uh, you know, it downloads everything because we didn't map it in. It doesn't have a rust uh, installed by default either. So um, it downloads everything. And then eventually in that uh, make file, it also uh, links everything together ultimately. Um, so it creates uh, a, a native library or two native libraries really and maps it all uh, together like links it together uh, with the generated enclave proxies and then outputs the enclave configuration and then it says yeah it's done so and then you have something in uh, in the bin folder and you can execute that and then yeah the result is hopefully something successful so let's look at what that looks like in code uh, maybe also a little bit bigger. So um, this is again the Hello Rust uh, tutorial. I'm SSH'd into this machine again, uh, and so we see that this is this is the main RS. So this these are the two parts. We have the app part here, and we have the enclave part here. So this is the Untrusted part is you know your regularly regular Rust program, and the enclave part is your trusted uh, environment here. And there's all kinds of other things to support that. So this is the the make file that we called earlier. This make file, um, you know, does if you want to if you enjoy reading make files, that is a <laughs> this is definitely a good read. Uh, but the important part is here that the SGX mode is here set to hardware which means that it tries to build it with uh, with a device that is called dev sgx sla uh, slash enclave, which is the newest driver that you can do. Previous drivers had like a dev isgx device instead. Um, yeah, so yeah, this this is what, what you have to call to build it. It does a lot of stuff. I didn't really find everything that I wanted to do um, in terms of linking. But yeah, because I, I feel like we could probably build more of that into the into the Rust build system. But yeah, maybe maybe later. <laughs> so uh, we see that uh, so first in the untrusted part, uh, it it uses a little bit of an older coding style, which is uh, which is or older a little bit more C C like coding style as well, um, and any. Un, uh, any of the trusted functions are imported using an extern statement. So this is just like as if you would interact with any uh, any kind of C library, any kind of native code. And uh, yeah, you have uh, you have specific types, and these types are obviously generated uh, at runtime and or, uh, at compile time rather. And you have a, a typical in a typical C fashion, you have returned. You have return values that come out as an out parameter, and you have a, a sort of a status uh, return 
return value um, of the function. This is the init um, part. So you initialize the enclave. Uh, you create sort of you call this create enclave uh, file with a few with a few parameters, and then this returns uh, yeah in a, in a typical fashion uh, SGX results. So yeah, it's a normal result with an XGS, uh, SGX uh, SGX error. <laughs> And Klaus, before we go into the main method, um, can I ask you a favor? Uh, yeah. There, there is a, a kind of flickering uh, when screen uh. sharing. We always see your beautiful car in the background. I think it's a Rolls <laughs> Royce. Uh, what we should should see. It wasn't that bad while we were looking at the at the slides, mm -hmm. but now when looking at the code, it's kind of um, disturbing. Can we try to stop screen sharing and re-share again, just to give it a try? Yeah, we can. Uh, but just to, to say, this is a this is a problem that I've always had, and I don't know what it is. I think it's ah okay. So it will probably not go away. Okay, it let's let's give it a try. And if not, uh, we'll accept that we can still read the code. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's worthwhile trying. Yeah, and uh, I think I mean I can try maybe sharing that specific window. Ah, good idea. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll see if that changes something. Is that I think this is what I'm looking at. All right. Does that change something? No, it still flickers. But I, oh. I think the the uh, if you move your mouse uh, as little as possible, <laughs> it's it's best. But it's <laughs> okay. okay. Great. We we can read the code. Yeah. It's, it's fine. So uh, yeah. please go on. It's very interesting, and we have a lot of discussion going on, and it's it's very good. So um, yeah, we, we right, will not uh, let ourselves distur uh, disturbed here. Yeah, and I'll try not to move my mouse uh, a lot. <laughs> so the main function, this is a hello world example. So it's pretty simple. It, um, it creates a string um, and it also uses the string, like the string as a pointer. If you have ever done any sort of um, native uh, code interaction with Rust. This is exactly the way to do it. This is, uh, you have an unsafe function, uh, you have an unsafe scope. Uh, you call that function, that extern function in that unsafe scope and you have to, uh, you know, do everything again as a pointer, just you, as if you would uh, do in C, which is kind of unsafe, uh, the short, well, in, a sh in short, it's, it's more C-like and it has to, in this case, and in every case, really, that has to do with um, with inter, uh, language interop, it, the Rust compiler doesn't can't guarantee any memory safety, which is why it's unsafe uh, to call in there, and everybody has to kind of uh, work out the how when to free the memory, um, yeah, on their own. So calling across this, as you can see, is fairly easy. If you have ever done anything, any C interoperability, this is basically the same. So then um, let's look at the enclave code. So this, uh, expectedly, this will have to be linked to something. So this uses dynamic linking. Uh, and in that case, that means uh, we have a build RS file. And that build RS file uh, talks about that, uh, or rather, it uses the, the linking, um, the dynamic linking that you would use. And it communicates, for those of you who have never done that, it communicates over the standard uh, standard out, which is quite funny. Uh, I thought so like such a simple way so, <laughs> uh, to communicate between, between the tools. But it works well, obviously. So enclave code. Um, the enclave is a fairly regular library. So you can see um, that this is uh, a, a static library. And um, it's a no STD library. So they, they use that, they use the sort of the attributes to do that. Um, you could, I think, do that same thing in the cargo toml. And there you also have to do the extern create uh, declarations as well. So um, that's something different. And as you can see, uh, they use, even though it says no STD, they use uh, STD imports in, in lines 30 to 33. And the reason they can do that is because the X, uh, SGX TSDD, uh, so the trusted um, standard library, is, is sort of aliased as STD. So this can be 
maybe a little bit confusing. I'm still torn about this practice, if that is a good practice or not. Um, but essentially what that gives you is a similar structure then uh, in, in the regular standard library and even comes with their own types like strings and vectors and stuff like that. Even re-exports of uh, traits like the, the write and read trait, which is quite cool. Uh, and yeah, you can even read, you know, files and stuff like that. So um, again, as uh, as with regular language interop with native code uh, is the no mangle um, attribute. And that means that the compiler doesn't change the name. So it doesn't do name mangling um, in order to preserve, so it preserves the name. So it can do a dynamic lookup of the function. And the same thing, it, write, it has to do a, an extern C. So it also uh, allocates sort of the function name in a specific part of the library. So uh, if you look at DLLs and, uh, and SO, so shared object uh, libraries on Linux, they all have a particular way of uh, memory layout where they put in the function names and then they, you know, other, other languages can look them up as if they were uh, native uh, libraries. Um, there's again, sort of, this is all safe code, uh, except for a few of these sort of, um, the stuff that comes in has to be, right? The, all the parameters then ha have to be, again, uh, added to a memory layout and potentially uh, casted, which is something that uh, Rust doesn't really do in a safe way uh, or can do in a safe way, but usually from pointer to a different type of pointer, it doesn't really like to do in a safe way. Therefore, there's a few unsafe things that you always have to do when um, working with these uh, with these yeah incoming types then um, yeah not not much uh, not very special here we can even use the the vec macro um, and all this is a no std environment and looks very very like an uh, like a regular rust program which is quite cool and is quite uh, yeah it's, it's impressive actually to how, how well they did here, I think. But uh, looking at the cargo toml, um, that looks a little bit different. <laughs> it definitely looks a, a little bit excessive for their all for their dependencies that they added here. Uh, and these dependencies are sort of uh, for build reasons there, I, I suppose, because they're all sort of out, outside of the target environment uh, of SGX. So if you look at the, the qualifier on uh, line 13, uh, this, these are all the dependencies when it's not in an SGX environment. Then uh, the enclave itself can be configured. So that, that's a config, there's an XML config file that uh, goes with the enclave, which um, gives it sort of where you can define uh, heap size, stack size, TCS num and TCS policy is about threading. So you have to define the number of threads beforehand. And the TCS policy, there's two types of threads. They're bounded and unbounded threads. And currently only bounded threads are supported. So then you actually have to put a zero there, um, but otherwise it just, just panics. <laughs> so that's something for, uh, for if you want to dive into C++ and I bet the developer's guide has something to say about that. Uh, that's, yeah, that, that's a different way of doing it. I think bounded thread, uh, threads are sort of bounded together with um, outside, so untrusted threads, um, but yeah, in, a, in, a, in some way that I didn't explore too deeply yet. So um, the second the second thing that I wanted to look at with you is the TLS um, part. So TLS um, is a client and a server, so two independent applications. Uh, again, the 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 app, so the the untrusted part is fairly straightforward. You have a, a lot more um, a lot more imported functions, and in this case, uh, after the um, initialization of the enclave, there's a lot of code, as you can see on the right. There's a lot of code there, um, and that is essentially a TLS client. And that TLS client is, if you look up the Rust TLS um, client example, it's exactly that thing. So this is the Rust TLS client, and it uses uh, a Mio to kind of uh, work on the stream um, to, to see when it has to read and when it has to write. So it's, uh, yeah. 
it's one way. It's a very, it's, it's not that uh, terribly complex, but it's definitely too much for, for me to walk you through this. Um, but yeah, you, you have a certificate, you have a host name, and then it does, uh, it, it uses a sort of a buffer internally. Um, usually it uses a buffer internally that does the, that does the, so first it reads stuff into its buffer and then it tries to decrypt it using the provided certificate. And in this case, we do the decrypting and the reading of the actual data inside the enclave. So every read TLS um, call on line 156 and uh, is forwarded into the enclave. So in 159, you see that this is calling into the enclave to read a buffer. And once that uh, results in something, well, just it hands it forward into the current buffer. And I think in this case, it just prints it out on the standard, uh, on the standard out. And it does the, yeah, the plating here. Here it does the printing on 206. And yeah, that's, that's sort of <laughs> what it does, right? It just prints it to, to standard out. The, the main function itself, uh, again, in it, the enclave, just as before, it uses, uh, a, it disconnects to the local server. So the, to the server part here, does uh, um, all the sort of, you know, connecting in different, uh, in different ways, instantiates the TLS client. The TLS client uh, in turn goes into the enclave and creates the TLS client there. So that this case, and this is why I wanted to show it to you is the enclave is also um, holding a state internally. So every time we call into the enclave, uh, even though these are independent function calls, we do get the same um, state internally. So we get the same TLS client internally that holds the certificate and that knows sort of, you know, what, that this is sort of, uh, this is an ongoing converse, conversation, if you want, an ongoing stream in that sense. In that sense. So uh, yeah, fairly straightforward. We send the HTTP request uh, as yeah as as raw as possible in there, and uh, then we then it loops and waits for events to come back and then yeah exit after that. But the interesting, more interesting parts are inside the enclave. So inside the enclave again, uh, single libRS file doesn't have to be that way, but it is in this case. Um, this has a lot more sort of imports from different, um, from even different uh, parts of the new sort of trusted standard library. And it also, it comes with, uh, as I said, sometimes there are specific types like an SGX RW lock, so a read write lock, um, and also SGX mutex, which is different than a regular mutex, obviously, because it's inside that encrypted part. Um, and here it's also using the no std version of Rust TLS and a patched version uh, of web P, uh, PKI. And we'll see that uh, later on. So it also uses lazy static uh, or rather and it also, but it uses lazy static, static to create um, a hash map, which, uh, well, a locked hash map, which is um, used to create uh, to to cache uh, those um, the the TLS client in between calls. So again, this is sort of the same structure as uh, in the untrusted part. So it has a read, write, do read, do write, but it also has a persistent cache here, which is what what it uses to to hold uh, to hold on to that data internally. And once that um, so once that is created in a new client, um, you see it creates a, a box. So it allocates heap memory uh, and puts that heap memory or puts that box into a new session. And that new session um, registers itself in the, in the global context uh, using a specific ID and that, well, the current, the current enclave ID. So then it associates, it has one, this lazy, lazy static um, uh, global memory sort of uh, and registers the pointer with the, the and associates it with the enclave ID and therefore carries over in between uh, different calls. It carries over what's 
uh, what's in that um, current TLS client. And that's quite, uh, quite interesting. It's not very easy to read, let's say like that, but it's very interesting how that, how that works. I see it as a session ID for the read. So you create it on one, at one point in time. Um, and then on line 310, you call read after some time, you use the session ID uh, and use it on uh, to fetch your session pointer and cast it. So line 317 and line 318 uh, do exactly that. So they fetch the session out of that global uh, registry and uh, transmute it or kind of cast it unsafe into uh, the session pointer and then can call obviously those uh, functions on that. So yeah, and then in this case, the reading is done, right? Uh, and after the reading, uh, it uses the, it um, copies the plain text into the output buffer and returns uh, a positive integer, like the number of bytes it read, which is quite typical for uh, any type of C programming. And this sample code in general is very much uh, C-like, <laughs> uh, not very Rust, like from a, a from a coding style. So something uh, that we didn't look at before. So we define all of these uh, external functions in in an EDL uh, file, and this EDL file uh, looks very much like a regular interface definition language that you've seen before, maybe. So it imports all of the uh, different um, extension or rather the, the the other things that are trusted calls. And if you wanted to add something here, like threading, for example, this would have, a, a, this would lead to another import statement that you'd have here. The e calls, so the, the calls into the enclave the, uh, are part of the trusted uh, scope. And if you had o calls, so outside or, or back outside, like a callback or something like that, uh, that you would that would be an uh, untrusted scope. So it would be exactly the same, in, uh, like here, right? It would use the same data types, and uh, uh, if you had here, and I would call untrusted, and then you would have all call, all calls defined defined in there that you would be able to use um, from inside uh, that lib rs. All right, so. For those wondering, there's also a Xargo Tommel here. Um, Xargo is a cross compilation uh, toolkit, <laughs> let's say, uh, and it's not used unless you wanted to, uh, unless you want to use it. It's um, yeah, it's fairly, it's yeah, just a normal, um, I think a conflict uh, config flag that you want to have it used here. Xargo SDK uh, SGX. Uh, I didn't use it and I didn't have the impression that you have to. Klaus, can I relay a question to you? Yeah. Um, we have a question. Um, does the SGX execution context have a different memory model compared to vanilla x86 because you use fences? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I would assume that uh, uh, that there's a lot, of, there's a a bunch of different things since it blocks off part of the memory. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I would assume yes, but I don't know. Okay, no problem. Uh, yeah, so this is already the last one uh, to show, but it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> so in this case, this is uh, when I executed, this is when I built the the the, the, the server and the client earlier. Um, we can run it again, but essentially this is this is gonna be output. So running the server and then connecting with the with the client is simple. And as you can see, this this uh, works. I think we should. Um, yeah, I don't think we have to run this particular one because we can move on to the last code and arguably the most important unit testing. So why is it Just the most before important? Before you move on, can, can I ask yeah. you another question before we Sure, sure, sure. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about uh, real world scenarios where this TLS client and or TLS server would come in handy? Something 
what would be possible through SGX and enclaves, what wouldn't be possible otherwise? Yeah, so um, for the TLS server, it, I, I guess the same thing applies that I'm gonna now say about the TLS clients. So in this case, this uh, here, so um, we create a, a TLS client here and we put in uh, the enclave and we put in a host name and the certificate. So if you wanted to make it really secure, you would not do that. You would probably deliver the certificate uh, as part of the application, uh, of part as part of the application. What that means is that you have a um, that you have a public key of something uh, to encrypt the uh, communication between you and the other um, the other party. So that could be a web server. Um, if you use, for example, a, a crypto exchange, uh, if you wanted a cryptocurrency exchange um, that you want to call, you use the public key, um, add that to your application so you don't have to read it from a potentially uh, a spoofed file, right? And um, encrypt this, uh, encrypt your communication essentially between inside the enclave and um, this exchange API. So what that means is that no one from the outside, so the outside only has the socket, but doesn't have the encryption, uh, the encryption key. So the encryption uh, will sort of uh, any party listening on that socket or doing a memory dump will not know what you are actually communicating between the enclave and uh, your other party, your trusted party. So that does two things. Uh, not only can you have a secret data exchange that uh, your host doesn't know about, but uh, you can also verify that uh, your the other party is actually the party that you're talking to. So in this case, uh, that would mean if you wanted to have finan uh, finance data and um, you know sort of do automated trading, for example, uh, or have a you know a distributed um, a distributed data collection. Um, that you know any anyone can run in a in a similar fashion that you you know you uh, that you would do like a SETI at home or something like that. Uh, everybody can participate in that data collection uh, without you know without you having to know that person or trust that person that they don't mess with your data in order to get sort of an advantage. So what it does is essentially that Enclave can then fetch data from that, uh, from that exchange, for example, uh, trading data, do something with it, you know, apply your secret or not secret algorithm uh, and the, you know, do some make trading decisions based on that. And you can only make really trading decisions if you're absolutely sure that the other thing, uh, that the other party or the data you're basing those decisions on is really the data you're uh, expecting and thinking about. And while this is a finance example, I think there are other examples where this is uh, this is interesting too. Like you could do information exchange uh, without you know without processing that specifically uh, for for financial trading, but you could make decisions based on uh, data, and that you can be sure that this data is only um, read by well the data that's been sent is only read by uh, inside the enclave, and what goes out of the enclave is maybe only the decision that has been made based on that data. So that would be one uh, one fairly, I think a fairly significant example because it's uh, it doesn't really mean you have to trust what which hardware it runs on. So this could be anything really from machine-based uh, interactions, right? You imagine your car uh, buying a parking ticket or something like that. You don't have to trust that uh, whoever uh, implements the software is kind of trying to cheat you because you you know that the enclave is running that uh, particular uh, particular code and you know that this uh, this communication is uh, first of all verified that this is your code so it does pay for the parking ticket <laughs> actually and not just send a number and the second thing is that uh, this is not really you know if you had more sensitive parking ticket is not very sensitive but if it was your uh, garage door opener or something like that, you would have want to have that encrypted as well. So there's different applications for that. And uh, this is what I'm now talking about is fairly specifically the town crier architecture uh, paper. So if you Google that, uh, you'll find the town crier architecture as a thing. 
Thank you very much. That clarifies a lot. Thank you. All right. So unit testing. Um, as good engineers, we want to unit test our stuff most of the time. Um, and this is also possible to do it within the enclave. So again, same structure. You have an app part and you have an enclave part. And the app part uh, has the app part has again um, a main function. In this case, it doesn't have to be the main function. You could also have, if you had a library, you could also do the same thing in the test function that is uh, outside. It's just regular Rust unit testing. Um, and yeah, in importing the test main entrance function as they named it, and running that will yield you uh, will run all of the tests. So um, what's the really interesting part, therefore, is happening in the enclave. And as you can see, they have built a bunch of modules for that uh, and chained it all together in the libRS and also created a SGXT unit test um, um, yeah, crate for use. And then uh, a macro to kind of uh, run all of these tests. Yeah, because it's probably more convenient. And yeah, so a ton of tests. And the reason why it's also important for this SDK is it's, uh, it shows you how to use all of the features that don't have sample codes. And that is, I think, fairly significant, especially if you wanted to build threads. <laughs> because threading is not that easy, as it turns out, because the, the, yeah, the documentation is a bit scarce, let's say, on that. Um, so this, this looks fairly normal, right? Thread, spawn, um, nothing nothing specific on that. You can also use a thread builder um, to work on that. But what the difference is, is that all of this has to be, first of all, declared in, in the EDL. So working on the threads here uh, is, is that. Then you have uh, config stuff that has to be changed. So in this case, we can build up to 10 threads, which is useful for unit tests in general. And the threading policy is not one, um, but zero, meaning that it, it has bounded threads and it uses the way uh, that the, well, the only way that the SDK recognizes uh, threads. Um, and other things uh, are similar like that, right? So how to use the random, uh, random generator, for example, uh, in there. So it has its own random generator, well, rather a patched, a patched version, I would assume, because a random generator is otherwise a feature of the operating system. And um, similarly, how to use uh, the patched version of um, of serialized uh, of JSON of JSON serialization there. And yeah, other things like you know how to use asserts, which is yeah, but it comes obviously also with similar functions. Uh, or macros in this case, like the should panic and uh, the assert macros that also I think are otherwise only available in um, in the standard library. And the other different things in there that uh, I have didn't find a place apparently in the other samples, like reading files, writing files, um, and yeah, timekeeping, uh, because obviously Timing is also something that the operating system provides, but if you don't trust the operating system, <laughs> it's very hard to time things. Uh, and yeah, it goes on like that. There's a, there's a lot of stuff in there. I think this is probably the most complete uh, imports that the entire sample set has. And it's, it shows that there's a, there's a few things in there that are really, really useful. Um, as also, as you can see that this has, um, regular dependencies, like stuff that comes from crates.io. Uh, uh, but most of the times you would have some sort of a, a Mesa Linux version of regular crates. And if we run that, and uh, this is the one that we are gonna actually, so this is the, the way that uh, you have to work um, when you're doing sort of SGX based programming. So you have, you're inside this sort of the root folder of your project. You run make. Um, you see that I ran make before, therefore it's not a lot of uh, not a lot of compiling. But um, you see that there's you know there's again the the enclave configuration as the output, 
and um, it has a lot more memory uh, than the others, which is also interesting. I've not run into an out of memory problem yet, but it seemed to have had that. And then you have to really uh, change your working directory into the bin folder and run the app. If you're not doing, if you don't do that, then you, uh, then you get a weird exception, which is, yeah, costs a little bit of headache. And as you can see, um, this is a fairly similar to what we would have in regular Rust unit testing. And uh, there's the few exceptions that are shown here also as in regular Rust unit testing shows you the panics and accepts them if the test says it should panic. And yeah, as you can see, 199 unit tests in there and all of them passed. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting, I think, that it works uh, like that. And again, yeah, you can create basically a regular tested application inside the Enclave call uh, and, and combine it with your regular tests from uh, your untrusted code. And therefore, yeah, follow good engineering practice, I guess, and still have trusted and untrusted um, uh, yeah, division. So, uh, and that's it. So you can, uh, I'll send out the link for this. If you don't, if you didn't type it already in your, into your browser, I can send you this uh, presentation. So these are the three examples. And yeah, so thanks for listening to me rant. And I think uh, if you, this is the last chance for questions maybe. <laughs> uh, but yeah, otherwise um, I blog sometimes on my blog. Uh, there's also a way you can find um, my books if you're interested. And yeah, other than that, thank you. Thank you, Raj. This is the first chance for me to say thank you. Thank you for this awesome talk. It was really interesting and it made me think a lot. I personally do a lot of work in the cloud computing space. I have been doing that for 10 years now. And I think this might be really a game changer for some applications because especially here in Europe, we have a lot of discussion going on whether we should trust US companies running clouds and so on. And how can we do critical workload in cloud data centers, which are obviously useful, but we don't trust 100%, maybe only 95%. And I guess this is really a, a very interesting option that, as I said, might be a big game changer. What would be interesting for me, and I encourage everybody to ask questions over Discord. I have a look at Discord, but one question comes from my side. Did you already use that in a real world project? I'm not asking for specifics or NDA breaks, but just um, any, any, uh, any experiences from real world on your side? Uh, well, it's not in production yet, but uh, the company I'm working with um, as a as a freelance consulting is uh, is use, is looking to launch um, end of December, and in this case it's uh, yeah it's a it's a crypto finance thing, and this is this is fairly yeah it's fairly mu uh, pretty much what I talked about as a real world example. Um, it's a bit, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that, but yes, this is that. And uh, another thing that is not for me personally, but uh, one password has been using uh, SGX for their encrypt for encrypting their password um, vault since yeah I think a couple of years since 2017 or something on the Windows. Okay, I see. So they don't use it in, on the on the cloud side, but they use it on the client side, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. If available, it's not that easy yet. <laughs> yeah, it's it's okay. deactivated by default, for example. I don't know why, but it is. <laughs> okay. Okay. In your project, did you, you really use Rust for implementing the Enclave code or did you go for C++? Rust. Yeah. Rust. Mm -hmm. I see. Very interesting. Very interesting. I take a look at Discord, whether we have any additional questions. I don't think so. Klaus, let me say thank you very much for this great talk. Oh, some some people are just just typing. Oh, uh, <laughs> awesome talk. <laughs> um, not Matthias is telling us that Signal is also using SGX. Oh, okay. great. So that, that's another use case then. Okay, that's another use case. Okay. Yeah. Um, Klaus, if you can and if you like, you can join us on Discord. Maybe you can hang around for a little bit longer. I'm not sure if you are already on our Discord server. If you are not, 
you are very much invited. Uh, uh, with that, people can maybe ask some questions or they can use your URL that you just shared here to get maybe in contact you, with you via Twitter or something like this. That is, yeah. is that okay? Yeah, that, yeah, it's great. I yeah. joined like an hour or something ago, so uh, I didn't I didn't claim my name yet, but you know you find me in in there. I think right okay. now. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much.